Here we go, Titus chapter 3. We're in this, this is, we're going to land the plane on the uh, series in Titus here. Uh, three weeks, three chapters. This is the final week. We've titled the series, The Power of the New Life. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter to a young up-and-coming pastor. He led to the Lord. He's discipled and mentored, and he's given him some pretty challenging assignments because Titus was a man, he was a leader, and he had some tough assignments in the New Testament. We learned a little bit about Titus, uh, that you know he's kind of like the army ranger, green beret of the New Testament. He was sent to Corinth, if you know anything about the New Testament and the letters there. The, the situation in Corinth was a little bit challenging and unruly at times, and Titus was significant in helping to instruct and correct and be a part of the work happening there in Corinth, and also in this little place on the island of Crete in the middle of the Mediterranean, which is where Paul is saying, hey, there's new churches, new believers there. Titus, I want you to go and put in order what's going on there. This is a new kind of young church plant, and they need help in establishing godly and strong leadership, raising up men, and and kind of figuring things out if they're going to be established to be a strong and a healthy church. How many of you think we need a few more strong, healthy churches in the world today? Anybody? If there's anything that we've seen, I love the, the practicality and the relevance of Titus for us in this time. It's one of what's called the pastoral epistles, pastoral letters, First and Second Timothy and Titus. And it's really, in many ways, providing in the New Testament a blueprint, a blueprint and a prototype for what a strong, healthy church that is architected and structured in order to be faithful, to be godly, in order to have an impact in the world. This is blueprint prototype instructions for a healthy church. And so kind of the framing question we've been working with, the essential question in part at the the letter of Titus answers is how do you live as an authentic, healthy Christian and church in an unstable and antagonistic culture? And we learned about Crete at the time, Paul's very clear in chapter one, he says, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. Sounds like a place that needs a strong church, right? Yeah, and so the situation, there's, there's struggles within, there's struggles without, and the reality is the instability and the threats and the dangers and an antagonistic culture to God's design for men, for women, for families, for leadership, these things were under attack in that day. Sound familiar? And to that context, Paul writes these instructions to Titus saying, this is how you strengthen and put in order what remains to establish a strong and healthy church. So it helps us think through, how do you live an authentic, healthy life as a Christian and and collectively as a church in that kind of setting? The title for this sermon this morning is The Kind of Church the World Needs. The Kind of Church the world needs. This is God's word instructing us how to lead and build a healthy, strong church. So we're going to look at the kind of church the world needs, and we'll see it actually in part as well by seeing the, the kind of church the world doesn't need. Let's jump in. Chapter 3, the first couple of verses, Paul continues to Titus, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. Now, that's been one of the easiest verses to obey over these last several years. In our, I'm kidding, right? It's challenging. But we have to remember and keep in context, there's several ditches when it comes to the reality of a Christian's relationship with government and with authorities. And we've spent some time thinking about this. We've had to think about this and dig into this over the last several years, and that's good and right. Because we're not called, on the one hand, to roll over and to be blind and to give a blank check in our obedience to tyrannical government. That's not what is being taught here. And so we have to think carefully and understand these verses like this. This is one of those passages we have to understand in its context so we don't misinterpret it, misapply it. You see, the Cretans had a reputation for a lack of restraint. One of the realities when the gospel grabs a hold of your heart through saving faith in Jesus Christ, you now have a new power and a new ability to run plays you couldn't run before. You now have the ability to exercise something that has been talked about a lot in Titus already called self-control. And Paul's telling Titus to remind the Cretans, look, when, when things get hot and heavy, you don't turn to the flesh and react in the flesh. And so, and so there's, on the one hand, th- this This passage even implies that rulers and authorities are not infringing upon God's law 
but are requiring what is good, right? And so we got to remember that the, the author of this just got out of prison for disobeying the authorities, right? So Paul knew when to get in trouble, when not to get in trouble. But on the other side of that ditch, Christians are not called to rage and riot and respond in a, in a rioting, revolt, violent kind of way. We see the way that the world can respond, either rolling over or rioting. Friends, the world does not need a rioting church. Christians ought to provide a contrast and a distinction in how we engage on these issues. We don't roll over. We don't riot. The world doesn't need a rioting church. Friends, how many of you think the world needs an intelligent church that knows how to reason with integrity, that knows how to be resolved and carefully draw the clear line of truth? The world needs a church that is resolved, but that knows how to reason with logic and truth, doesn't surrender the truth, and doesn't walk in the flesh. And so how do you live as an authentic, healthy Christian in church? Well, you don't play dumb and you don't play dirty. You don't play dumb, right? This, this is not blind, blank check obedience to tyrannical government, right? We're, we're, we're thoughtful. We see this in the Apostle Paul in his life, even in the, in the book of Acts, how he engaged ruling, governing authorities. He appealed to God's law, to moral law, even to Roman law because he knew it. He understood it and knew how to carefully work out these issues in his relationship with governing authorities. And you see when he's brought before, he reasoned with them on the basis of truth and logic. He reasoned peacefully and persuasively because he was resolved. But he didn't play dumb. Christians are to be, in that sense, a model citizenship of informed, intelligent people who know what is good, who know what is wrong, who help hold government responsible to their role of requiring what is good and not infringing upon God's law, moral law, and the consciences of their people. And so, yes, there is a time for conscientious objection and resistance, but even in the manner in which we do so, the gospel informs that resistance. And we see that instruction here to the Cretans, who might, you might say were given to be a little bit hot, uh, hot-headish, right? And, and so we see the, the, uh, the counsel that Paul is giving here. We don't play dumb on the one hand, nor do we play dirty. I played enough sports to remember there are different ways and tricks and people can play dirty. How many of you know it's not super fun when you're endeavoring to play with integrity when you're playing a team that plays dirty? And that's the reality. As a Christian, we, we, we hold this tension and this reality of we're not playing dumb, but nor do we give in and play dirty. We don't, we don't riot. We don't destroy property. We don't rage against the machine and whine and bully and smash and grab until we get our way. See, there, there's a way in which you do that in your flesh and the way when you don't get your way. Think about how you respond when you don't get your way. How many of you know that you have a new power source in the reality of the gospel changes the way you respond when you don't get your way? So we don't, we don't go about things the way the world does or even the way we used to any longer. The gospel has the power to transform your attitudes and your actions and your speech even when you're locked in legitimate conflict or conversation about what is good, what is right. As Christians, we ought to provide accountability to our government, but we ought to be careful in how we treat individuals and people in that process. Self-control. Our attitudes and our actions get brought in line with the Spirit. Christians are not to be mindless, careless, naive, simple, gullible, nor disorderly, destructive, rude, and arrogant. We reason with integrity. We're not easily enslaved, nor are we easily dismissed. So, a few takeaways. Get in trouble where you need to get in trouble, and don't get in trouble where you don't need to get in trouble. Right? Our brothers and sisters in China are living in this reality right now. Do you know you can get evicted from your place uh, where you live, you can lose your job, and you can be arrested for participating in church online? Online. In China, But our brothers and sisters are not 
ceasing to, to uh, proclaim the name of Jesus, to bear witness to the name of Jesus publicly because there are things that you don't surrender and give up even when forced to or called to by government. And so, by all means, Paul, again, gets out of prison writing this letter, modeled it in his life, taught throughout the New Testament, get in trouble where you need to get in trouble, but don't get in trouble where you don't need to get in trouble, which means we guard our heart and our speech. Notice he says, we slander no one is the way that you engage with people. Guard your heart and your speech. Stay humble. Notice humility does not mean soft, spineless, and silent. And lastly, the worst, right, in general, big idea, what's Paul saying to Titus to instruct the believers there in Crete? Look, the worst part of someone's day, generally speaking, should not be their interaction with a Christian. Okay? Right? Like, like we used to road rage, we don't road rage anymore. Like, that's the call to maturity, that's the call to subdue the flesh and not respond or react or live in the flesh, but to respond and react and live in the spirit and to have attitudes, actions, and aroma of Jesus transforming how you thoughtfully, reasonably, respectfully engage on these kinds of issues. Let's look at the next section, chap, uh, chapter 3, verse 3. Notice now, Paul saying there's a, there's a reason why we treat people a certain way, because at one time we too were foolish disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Now, pause. That's quite the description, isn't it? Of life before Jesus, before the following happens. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us. How? Through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. What's Paul saying? Friends, the world does not need a self-righteous church. Come on, the world does not need a self-righteous church. Don't forget who you were, who you are, how you got in here. What the world needs is a church who remembers and rehearses the reality that you, friends, were justified by grace. Come on, if you're in Christ, if you're in his grace, it's not because of righteous things that you did, but it's the sheer kindness, love, and mercy of God who poured out his Holy Spirit upon you and changed your heart. At one time, you were a knucklehead, so be careful in your heart how you view knuckleheads. The world doesn't need a self-righteous church. How do you live as an authentic, healthy Christian and church? Friends, never forget how you were saved. That has a way of fixing the holier-than-thou attitude. What, what th this paragraph is one of the clearest, most explicit descriptions in the entire New Testament, in the Bible, of how a person becomes a Christian and what has happened for you, what has happened to you, what God did. If you're a Christian, this is what happened to you, and this is how it happened. You, friends, were born again by the miraculous, gracious, merciful work of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon you and changing your heart. This is why we never give up. We never give up on our nation, on a state, on a, on a person you know. We never give up. Why? Because God alone, in the power of the gospel, the power of his grace, he can make a hard heart, hard heart soft. The enslaved can be set free. The disobedient can become obedient. The foolish can become wise. Haters can become lovers. Takers can become givers. That's the power of the gospel. Amen. 
The world needs not a self-righteous church, but a revived church that's humbled, that's grateful, that's in awe, that's a worshiping church, that's responding to the sheer amazing reality of what it is to be justified by grace alone through the gracious work of God in your heart and in your life. It, I want you to make this connection from Titus 3, where we are right now, 3 through 8, to the words found in John chapter 3. The words of Jesus on the little conversation he had with a man named Nicodemus in John 3, 1 through 8. It says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. No one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. You see what he's saying? You must be born of water and the Spirit, meaning natural birth and spiritual birth. Anybody who can see the kingdom of God or enter the kingdom of God does so only because the Spirit of God has blown through your heart. He busted the doors open and the wind blew and here you are. That's the work of the Holy Spirit that begins to move in and invade your mind and your heart and like water pouring over. That's why when we pray and when we sing and we gather as the church, come on, we get soaking wet. The Holy Spirit's been poured out generously upon us. We've been made sons and daughters of God. We're now called heirs. We're heirs. We're at the table. We've got that promise of the hope of eternal life. This is the house of grace. This is the house of mercy. This is the house of kindness. This is the house of justification by his grace alone. This is the house of hope. This is the house where the Holy Spirit, come on, the wind blows and people get brought in. This is not the house of self-righteousness. That's what Paul's saying. The world does not need a self-righteous church. Because it needs a church that remembers and knows you didn't earn it, you didn't deserve it. It's not because of righteous things you have done. You didn't pull yourself up, you didn't snap yourself into line. God acted in your mind and heart and life, opened your eyes, changed your heart, made you new. And that changes the way you look at the world. That changes the way you look at Jesus, that changes the way you look at other people, it changes the way you look and think about yourself. A humble church, a grateful church, a worshiping church, a revived church. A few takeaways. Power for new life is available. No one is beyond the reach or grace of God. Well, that, 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 that's good news. Now, now, Paul himself knew this road, this reality. He was Saul, as you recall, and he used to drag away men and women to be, to be arrested for follower, being followers of the way of Jesus, literally to be murdered. He, he was there overseeing the martyrdom and the execution of a man named Stephen. In Acts chapter 7, they were people that were stoning Stephen were laying their cloaks down at the feet of Saul. Now, now, no, notice, no one is beyond the reach and grace of God. The reality is everyone is beyond your and my reach. But no one is beyond the reach of God. And when I say we don't give up on people, in your heart and in your mind, we don't give up on people, but neither do we go chasing people down. God ultimately is the one who chases them down. We pray. There comes a time and a place. We, we, are, we talk to our city group leaders about this all the time. We say, who's leaning in? Look for the low-hanging fruit, right? I mean, I, the reality is 
People were not, the Christians were not going and like trying to take Saul to, to coffee. They, were, they weren't going and knocking on Saul's door like trying to read. They were running away from him. In fact, when, when, when God struck Saul blind, Acts chapter 9, knocked him off his high horse and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The Lord Jesus revealed himself to Saul, said, hey, you, you're, you're going gonna, you're gonna to switch teams, okay? You're, you're, you're being traded. You were going the wrong way. I'm going to flip you around. I'm going to use you as an instrument to tell the world about me. So taking the public enemy number one against Christianity and, and Jesus, I'm bringing you on my team. And he gave a vision to a man named Ananias. And he said, Ananias, I got an assignment for you. You ready? And his heart was pleased. He said, yeah, Lord, I'm ready. Okay, I want you to go talk to a man named Saul. He's like, wait, uh, hold, uh, Lord, I got a few questions. I just want to clarify if we're talking about the Saul that I think we're talking about. He says, yes, that Saul. I've given him a vision that says a man named Ananias is going to come and pray for him. And I've chosen him to be my instrument. And, be, and, and, and we know the story. He became the greatest church planting missionary entrepreneur of the New Testament. And Ananias and now imagine walking up to that door, uh, right? And I says, Brother Saul, God has chosen you. And he prays for him. Scales fall from his eyes. And he baptizes him. And Saul, as we know, Paul. But here's the reality, friends. No one is beyond the reach and grace of God. But there are people that God alone is the one who can flip the switch. And we got to let God do his work in people's hearts. You pray, you pray, but we don't go, we don't go chasing down those that are, that are seeking to do the church harm. We're not pursuing that. We're, we're, there's a time it says, hey, dust the feet off, keep moving. You keep feeding the hungry. You look in front of you. You worry about your, your neighbor. Get to know your name. What's their name? What's, what's their birth date? You know, figure that out. So don't give up on people in your mind, and your heart. We're ready to, when the spirit of God has done that, all, that, heart-changing work, we're ready. Don't write anybody off, though, in your mind and your heart. God can take the biggest enemy and turn him and make him an instrument in his hand. God, you flip those switches. Secondly, notice how we treat others flows directly from the gospel of salvation. He's saying, look, the reason why, through self-control and the work of the Holy Spirit, we engage in a new and different way, right, than the world engages, we do that we provide a contrast to that because how we're treating others flows directly from the reality of our own salvation. Thirdly, remember where you came from. Remember what it is to be lost and dead in sin. It's, he says clearly, we were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved, malice and envy, hated, hating one another, all kinds of passions and pleasures. So before you go looking down your nose at others. Hey, pause, remember where you were. It, but side note, isn't it amazing how quickly we can become self-righteous? How quickly, right? I mean, you can, you can read about a, a new diet and the foods you shouldn't eat anymore, and two days later, someone's still eating those foods, and like, man, you're an idiot. You shouldn't be eating those. Like, you just, you just learned that two days ago, bro. <laughs> you were eating that thing last week, okay? Right? Like, we can, be, we can get new information, new knowledge. It's, you can be two days alive in Jesus. You're like, oh, I'm just so mad at the world. They have not accepted Jesus. Like, bro, you went 35 years not accepting Jesus. <laughs> you, you, right? Like, like be, hold, hold, pull back the hammer on the knuckleheads because yesterday you were knucklehead. <laughs> Don't forget. Don't forget. And lastly, we never graduate beyond the gospel. The gospel, justification by grace alone, powers godliness and good works. It powers the new life. When you're building the car, you put the engine together, you put the engine there, you're going to build up the rest of the frame, you're doing all this stuff, add the doors, add the wheels. You don't put on the wheels and the doors and then take the engine out. No, no, like, like that gets put in there, and then that, that's, not, that's not just like the part we do at the beginning, make sure we got the engine fine, and then we build the rest of the car. No, like the engine is needed for everywhere you're going to go. So it is with the gospel. It's what the grace of God that saves you is the grace of God that strengthens you and sustains you, and as we saw in chapter 2, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and unrighteousness and live new lives. The grace of God saves you, strengthens and sustains you, and propels you in the life that God has called his church. To be a stronger, healthy, vibrant, bright Christian church, we don't graduate or move beyond 
the gospel. It empowers everything that follows. Let's look at verse 9, next section. He goes on, he says, But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law, because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once, and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You see, again, you see the judicious reality of wisdom and what Paul's saying? He's saying, hey, we, no one's beyond the reach of grace of God, but y'all be wise with your time and your energy and what you're doing. And this is how you deal with divisive people and argument of people. This is what I want you to do. Warn them once, warn them twice. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. Now, I, I, find, I find it Interesting that right after one of the most explicit descriptions of what happens and, and how a Christian gets saved and becomes a Christian, and we love in the church historically in America to get into all kinds of controversies and arguments and debates so we can be theologically and practically, we dig in all these things, and Paul's saying, look, this is what's happened to you, but make sure that you don't get hung up and stuck in the mud in the weeds with quarrels and controversies and genealogies and get pulled off mission by all of this. Why? Because these divisions ultimately result in distractions. And friends, the world does not need a distracted church. The world doesn't need a distracted church. How do you live as an authentic, healthy Christian in church? Answer number three, don't be distracted by foolish divisions. And as we say, don't wrestle with pigs. You both get muddy, but the pig loves it. Right? Like, like we don't get bogged down in endless arguments and controversies, there comes a point where arguing becomes pointless, debating becomes fruitless, it becomes useless. I mean, we all know, come on, how many of you know that church just becomes so much fun when it's one big argument? Yeah. <laughs> one of the things that I love, and I hear it all the time, we hear it all the time about Grace City Church, is that there are people who are stepping in the doors of Grace City Church or watching online or coming to an event or beginning, they're coming to a church for the first time ever or they're coming to church again and they never thought they would because they've ex many of you in this room have experienced the reality of yucky church. You've got the scars on your back. When church becomes marked by infighting and argument, arguing and controversy and conflict, come on, it ceases to become productive and useful. It's no longer focused on Jesus and the mission of the gospel. And for be honest, you, you know, there's people that know the reality. Like, I thought I'd never go back to church. Now, so, so I know, I'm, not, I'm not a big, you know, hashtag church hurt guy. Right? I mean, it's like, like there's the hashtag Me Too movement, there's a hash, and there's Christian versions of all this stuff that, that is not healthy at all, in my opinion. Do we sin against each other? Do you get hurt? Of course. We put a bunch of sinners in the room. What do you think is going to happen? But the power of the gospel transforms the way we relate to one another, the way we navigate that, work through that, and then there comes a point in time where we don't give in and, and, and just love to be in the midst of the ongoing bickering and fighting and arguing and controversies. And when it comes to how you deal, Paul instructing Titus in the church how to deal with divisive people, he says, attempt once, attempt twice, that's it. Now, we don't know, again, how God will work in someone's heart and mind and change. That, that's for him to do. But, but here's the church cycle that happens. The reason why Paul is instructing Titus and to instruct the church carefully when it comes to foolish divisions and arguments is because this is the enemy's ploy. Divisions become distractions. Distractions become dilution. Dilution becomes death. When, when you get divided, you get distracted. When you get distracted, you get diluted. When you get diluted, you're dead, right? Friends, this is not like hint of Jesus church, like LaCroix church. Like I think it's supposed to be fruity. It's supposed to have flavor. It's supposed to. It's, that's what... Right? But that's what delusion is, right? And like, friends, like, it's like, like, it's, 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 it's like gospel light, you know what I mean? Like, we just edit and change some of the parts here, or we back off certain things, or we, you know, it's like divisions become distractions, distractions become delusion, delusion becomes 
death. How do you know if a Christian or a church is off mission? Because they have time to argue and get stuck in the mud. That's how you know if you're off mission. If you know more about some controversy and some church situation going on halfway around the world and you don't know your neighbor's birthday, you off mission. And Paul's saying, the world does not need a distracted church. What your neighbor needs is not for you to go, oh, let me tell you about how crappy church can be. You want to come? So, a few takeaways. Satan always seeks to divide and distract in his attempt to destroy. He always seeks to divide and distract in his attempt to destroy. When church becomes one big argument and controversy, it becomes useless. Look, at, at, at some point, the way we talk about this, we go round and round. It's like, no, I'm not going not gonna to respond to that email, not going to have that meeting. This is the way I say it. It's like we, we deal with situations that come up along the way, and as we deal with that, here, it's, I got no more tickets for that ride. Nope, right? Like, it's no longer a wise stewardship of my life and my time and my energy to Jesus or to the flock of the church that's moving forward on mission of Jesus for me to continue to get stuck and embroiled in all of these sideline controversies. We live in a day and an age, by the way. There's new temptations for this stuff. There's the, there's the whole, like, there's like Christian TMZ. There's a whole new industry of, like, gossip and slander in the name of, like, Christian blogs, and, and people are like, oh, man, you got to hear this podcast. you got to read this blog. you got to do all this stuff. It's like, no, no, you don't, and no, you shouldn't. Like, it's not healthy for your soul to just dive in and know everything about the latest and greatest and this megachurch pastor over here and what happened with this and all this. It's like Paul's saying, look, you're, you're distracted. And, 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 that, and that becomes useless for the reality of keeping the main thing the main thing. Let's talk about grace. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about what he's done for us. Let's talk about the work of the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about life-giving relationships. Let's talk about being focused and being unified and moving forward and making Jesus famous in our town and our generation. Let's talk about that. See, he's saying, don't get dragged into drama. This is just corrective, right? It's like, how do you want to be a healthy, strong Christian at church? Like, look, like the reality is the mature, wise people of God who exude the attitudes, actions, aroma, and discernment that Jesus would have for them are cautious and careful about the kinds of, hey, conversations, too. let's learn, let's dig in theologically, let's understand these things, but professional arguers not needed, need not apply. You've you, you got to be aware and on guard because the reality is friends when we lose sight of grace is when we start putting sand in the gears when we lose sight of the justification by grace alone we lose sight of the gospel how do you know when a church is off mission they're no longer enamored with the beauty and the wonder and the power of Jesus and changing lives and what God is doing and now the flesh has stepped in and it's all about when you're no longer soaking wet you've dried out and things just rub and get you know, sand in the gear, sand and dry skin, how does that do? Does that do well together? Some of you go to the beach this summer, you go on vacation somewhere, nice sandy beach, you know that ain't fun. When it's dry sand, and, yeah. When we lose sight of grace, we're no longer walking in step with the Spirit. That's when we start to put sand in the gear. By the way, friends, this is true in your marriage. Those of you that are married here, right, when we lose sight of grace, we start chipping and chirping, and this is where you start putting sand in the gears, and it's like, that's the stuff of the flesh, and God is saying, oh man, come on now, this, let me bring you over to health, bring you over to strength, let's brighten up that witness, and that's how we do it. Let's look at the last section. And by the way, the conclusion of these letters, don't skip it, this is the word of God. There's some nuggets, there's some things to take away for this. This is inspired scripture. There's good things in the introductions and conclusions of these letters. Check it out, verse 12. As soon as I send Artemis and Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis because I have decided to winter there. Paul saying to Titus, look, I'm giving you this assignment. Go put things in order. But by the way, we got other work to do. So you got get it done by winter. Get it done by winter. I'm sending some reinforcements, sending some backup, and then get back here. I want you to join me. Now look at verse 13. Do everything you can to help. Do everything you can to help Zenos the lawyer. Even lawyers can get saved. Praise God. And <laughs> Apollos is on their way and see that they have everything they need. 
Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Everyone with me sends you greetings. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Look at the reality of the interconnectedness and the relationship and the, and the buy-in and the commitment and the devotion and the way that they're... Come on, we say all the time, Christianity is a team sport. This is why we, we love... I mean, the things that come rolling out of city groups and life together and the way we provide for each other's needs and help each other out, the way that we live productive lives in order to be able to meet urgent needs. And it's amazing. Come on, the body of Christ, when it's functioning healthy and strong, it's incredible because the world does not need a disengaged church. The world doesn't need a disengaged church. Now you think about it, as Christians, for those who say, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus, the New Testament knows no ideal description or prescription of a churchless Christian. We hear this all the time, though. Like, I love Jesus, but I just don't, don't love the church. And we, and we walk through the reality that's because when church becomes what it ought not to be, then, yeah, who, who would love it? I'd be like, Ugh, that's tough. That's hard. I get it. But how do you live as an authentic, healthy Christian in church? Answer number four. Don't merely be a consumer, be meaningfully engaged. Friends, we are the body of Christ. We're the family of God. We're the body of Christ. Now, what we say here, I love it. At Grace City Church, people come, you kick the tires, you check it out. Is this for real? These guys for real? You get answers to your questions. You heal up, you renew, you restore. You come in here, it's like, man, you're breathing the clean air. I love it. Yes and amen. Grace upon grace. And then once you've dabbled a little, once you've dipped in a little, come on, the people of Grace City, that's what we love about it, we dive in. Kick the tires. Awesome. Check it out. And then wherever you are, be there. Be engaged. Jump in. That's why we love. We took all our door holders, grace teamers up to slide waters. Had an awesome time. Last Sunday, people jump in. This is the way, this is the way of church together at Grace City where everyone plays and all of life counts and people are meaningfully engaged in relationships. People say, man, how do you keep up with the needs pastorally and this, that, whatever? It's like I hear about things we talk about all the time. I, we hear about things after it's been dealt with. People were given washers and dryers and cars were bought and given this and they, oh, we got it and meals and provided for urgent needs and loved and showed up and prayed and cared for and helped and we'll get them there and move them here and help them with that. And I heard you were going to there, you know, see your dad and do that. That's amazing. That's awesome. Here, let me help you get there. You need some money. How you doing? Whatever. I mean, the generosity and the life and the love and the connectedness and the engagement that's flowing in the people of God, when that thing is humming, come on, woo. beautiful. The world doesn't need a disengaged church. It needs an engaged, all-in church. You know who doesn't argue and bicker and take? Those who have skin in the game. Right? It's like, man, when, when, when you're someplace and you see people are, people are working urgently and they're trying to help and they're bailing water and you sit back there and you're like, man, I'm not sure if they're going to make it. I don't think they're using the right buckets. I mean, I see some of the extra ones over there, but, you know, I'm, I don't know. They, I don't know. It doesn't look like they have a real good system going on for how they're doing it. It's like, yo, grab a bucket. Feel free. There's a couple extras right there. Like, grab the bucket. Jump in. Help out, right? Like, that's the attitude and the heart, right? It's like not criticizing those who are doing and trying, but we get busy trying and helping. And I love that about Grace City, right? Because that, that, that's, that's, that's the way of healthy church, of strong church. You don't tear down those who are trying. We get busy trying and helping. We're not mere observers. We're not mere consumers. All right, so a few, few takeaways. Number one, be generous with one another. You see, you see it in the text there? Look at, look at, I mean, there's incredible little nuggets there. Look at how their life was together as the people of God, being generous with one another being relationally engaged, and being devoted to doing good. We see this phrase, this emphasis on doing good six times in Titus. It's a really significant theme, being devoted to doing good. Now, the band can come out, worship team, we're going to get ready for communion, and, and, and we're going to worship the Lord, and 
respond with communion this morning. Here's just a, a final thought that we see as we land the plane on Titus. Truth and grace, right, the gospel, produces godliness and good works. It, it literally leads to, it empowers, it brings about new life. And we've looked through all throughout the letter of Titus, the marks and the reality and the components that make up this new life. And it's a life that upholds the integrity of God in his word, honors God in his word. It, it's, a, it's a church that raises up men to lead and men of integrity, men to be strong. It strengthens families, men and women, older, younger. It builds up the basic building blocks of society, which is the basic building blocks of the church. It engages culture. It engages as a model citizenship that's not given to either the ditch of rolling over or rioting. We provide a contrast in the way that we intelligently and reasonably with integrity engage winsomely, persuasively, peacefully. And we don't give up precious truth and freedom and ground. But we, but we drop the bricks. We don't come with the bricks. We come with broken hearts. And we pray and we reason and we talk. And we persuade and we engage and we stay engaged. We stay humble. And we're propelled by grace. We never forget where we were. We don't forget where we came from. We don't forget how we got in. We're devoted to good works, to doing good. And we'll lay our life down for one another, for our brothers and our sisters. We'll lay our life down. We're engaged. We're all in. See, where does the church learn these things? Friends, we are the body of Christ. These, this is what Jesus did. He honored his Father and his Father's word. He raised up men to lead the charge he strengthened families and gave sons and daughters back to their moms and dads. He engaged with reason and logic on fire, confounding the wise and the crowds with his ability to articulate and thread the needle about what is true and what is false. He was humble. He was propelled by grace. He was devoted to his mission, not distracted didn't get stuck in the mud. He stayed on point, continued to do good, and he laid down his life. And he shed his blood and promised to build his church, friends. And the Christian and the church that walks on this trajectory and this path is the Christian and the church that changes the world. This kind of church that the Word of God is giving blueprints and instruction for is the church that changes the world. It's the body of Christ in action, visible, moving, speaking, loving, walking on earth today, and it changes the world. It changes the world. It always has, it is, and it will change the world. This kind of church Honoring God in His Word, raising up men, strengthening families, engaging hum humbly, reasonably, propelled by grace, devoted to doing good, laying down their life. This kind of church changes what happens in Uvalde, Texas. It changes the world. Stronger pastors and leaders and men and families and Christians change the world. This is the church that Jesus died to birth and to feed and to build and to unleash and to send out and say, drive this kind of church. Don't, don't change the engine. Don't take it out. Pop the clutch and see what this thing can do. Drive this kind of church around Wenatchee. Drive this kind of church around Washington. Drive this kind of church around our nation. Friends, the world needs stronger, brighter, healthy churches, pastors, leaders, men, families. It changes the world. And it starts loving your neighbor. 
Changes the world. Starts across the street. Starts in your own home. Starts in the household. How you love one another. How you build one another up. How you learn to walk in the ways and the attitudes and the new life of Jesus. How you treat people. How you believe and don't lose hope and don't give up. Because no one's beyond the reach of the grace of God. Because I could tell you a story about where I was and who reached down and took hold. Come on, that's our story. So this table represents the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus that was laid down so that you could have new life. It just takes a simple prayer. God, give me a new heart. Give me a new life. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon me. Lord, take away that anger and the rage. Take away the self-righteousness. Take away the unhealthy appetite and desire, Lord, the division and the distraction. Take away, God, my, my, my fear or my whatever that is that's holding me back from engaging and being all in. Change my heart. Make me new. And this table represents the grace that saves you and strengthens you and sustains you. It's a reminder of the blood that was shed to make you new and to grow you up and make you strong, make you bright. This provides a stark contrast in the world. And he says, you'll become like a city on a hill, like a light in darkness. You become a witness to Jesus and a display of the power of new life. This is what Jesus is building. This is what he's wanting to do in our hearts and with our lives, continually mold us, shape us, lead us, guide us, produce this kind of new life in us. And so as you come to the table today, you do so to in humility and in gratitude and to worship the Lord. And if you're not a Christian, you can become one today. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Make me new. And you can come. This table's for those who've placed their faith in Jesus. And so, Father, I thank you. Jesus, I thank you. I pray that you would do your work in our hearts and continue to build your church right here among us. Lord, we pray that you would continue to protect and preserve and fuel and propel what you're doing among us here at Grace City Church. That you would continually strengthen and refine and revive and purify and use us, Father, to be a witness for you in our generation, in our lifetime. God, would you be honored? Would you be praised? And would we bear the fruit and the marks of the new life that you've given us and called us to by your grace, by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.